Welcome, welcome to Creating a Study Space and Academic Life Skills by me, Dr. Sonia Travaglini. I'm the Learning and Success Specialist here at ESS and delighted to join you to talk about some of the top tips we've heard throughout our series of workshops and some other good information as well that I've gathered together. Now, if you have questions at any time, do drop them into the chat. Uh, you can also PM them in the chat if you want them to be private, or of course, uh, you can also use the Q and A function as well. So today we're really going to be looking at three different top tip areas. The first is really creating those study spaces. Now that we're all learning online, uh, perhaps we're learning at home, perhaps we're learning at somewhere new, uh, we can look at some ways that you can leverage your space around you to help maximize your learning. And one of the top questions we get here at ESS is how to manage time. So as part of uh, academic life skills, we're gonna look at the best ways you can use to maximize the time that you do have, and also look at some general top tips uh, for your life here at Berkeley that can help smooth your path through your academics. I'm gonna talk for a few minutes, welcome, and give you a little background as well about why I'm so passionate about all of these uh, interesting topics. And then I'm gonna do a little bit of a talking and an interactive design sprint uh, with our attendees, or we may just continue. And then there's plenty of time as well throughout with points for questions, and of course, time at the end as well if you have specific questions for the Q&A. Now, as I said, you can check out these notes anytime you like. Uh, and if you're finding it a little hard to stay engaged uh, with all of the different learning, especially on Zoom, why not try checking out these notes and navigating to the presentation link that's on the screen, it's also in the chat, or indeed you can use the QR code that's on the screen. If you hold your smartphone up, it will navigate there for you. And follow along with the presentation, perhaps annotating it with your own thoughts and ideas, or even try drawing out the information that's given in this presentation, kind of like a comic strip. And both of those are great ways to stay engaged if your brain is a little bit tired of learning at the end of the day. So a quick bit of background as to why I'm sharing all this information. Uh, I'm an engineer, originally I was studying product design and innovation. And if you can't hear, I was originally from England. Uh, and during that, I got very interested in how people learn, what is the best way to learn. And uh, I originally joined uh, my PhD in mechanical engineering, actually after getting interested in sign language at Berkeley City College. So I've taken a bit of a windy route through education and tried all different types of topics, uh, which is the reason I'm so interested in the best way to learn, as it turns out learning is actually quite hard for every single subject. During my PhD in mechanical engineering uh, here at UC Berkeley, go Bears, I got very interested in teaching. And that's where I started to focus on engineering education and joined the ESS team to focus on learning and success and really help support students to get the maximum out of their time studying here. Now, if like me, it's been a bit of a tough old week and your brain is a bit tired, I'd like to invite you to spend just 60 seconds de-stressing the brain and giving yourself a one minute breather so that we can focus on learning and taking in information. So uh, hopefully everyone will join me for just a 60 seconds relaxation. Hi and welcome to Headspace. So no matter what's going on in your life right now, no matter how many thoughts are racing around your mind, no matter how the body's feeling, just take a moment to sit down and take a big deep breath, breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth. As you breathe in, a sense of taking in fresh air, the lungs expanding. As you breathe out, a sense of letting go of any stress in the body, in the mind, just feeling the muscles soften and relax. And close your eyes if you'd like to one more, breathing deeply in through the nose and out through the mouth. And just take a moment to pause, allow the thoughts to come and go. And then just gently opening the eyes again. Well, hopefully everyone enjoyed uh, just taking 
60 seconds to de-stress the brain and that's my first top tip for the day is during your learning about every 20 minutes to half an hour just take even 60 seconds to relax the brain focus on something else maybe stand up and do a little stretch which really helps your brain reinvigorate itself uh, because it is a heavy lift and heavy demands on the brain constantly learning hi and on we go so first we're going to focus on how to maximize the study spaces you have now this can be quite a challenge with remote learning because uh, normally we'd have lots of good tips about how to go to coffee shops and how to leverage libraries to study uh, but unless you're very lucky and don't have a we don't tend to have a coffee shop in the library in our own homes we have to make do with what's around us now, the first thing to do is to really figure out where is your optimum or available space. Now, a lot of us may not have a lot of space and you may actually have to claim a space to be able to make it your regular workplace. Some of us like to study in our beds and hang out there as well. But that can actually be a bit of a problem for our brain because it kind of trains our brain to expect to do sleeping and relaxing and hanging out and learning all in the same space. One of the easiest ways to get your brain into a learning mode is to claim a particular place uh, and maybe use a desk protector or maybe just a favorite placemat or maybe even just an image that you like and print out uh, at home and your favorite stationery as well if you have it to be able to set your space up to be somewhere that you recognize as your mini space to study. Now, if you're lucky, you can obviously have a desk at home. Not all of us have access to that. So it may just be a spot on the sofa with a little file folder next to you with all of your bits and bobs that you use for studying. Uh, if you don't have any stationary supplies uh, or you don't have any uh, particular things like file folders, try checking out your local dollar store as they often have excellent supplies for, unsurprisingly, a dollar. Uh, and you can really look around there, see some things that catch your eye or maybe excite you with the idea being to just spruce up the space you're in and make a little bit of excitement. Again, you're putting all the things you regularly need to use around you. It sounds like an obvious one, but I have often found myself leaving my folders in one place and my, my charger in another. And then when I start to study, I have to gather everything together and it just makes a bigger barrier to getting going. So gather everything you need, notebooks, for example, uh, maybe even a clipboard if you like to have lists organized around you. And of course, your laptop charger so that you're ready to go. Now, if you're not lucky enough to have your own desk or your own space, you may have to just find a, a space where you can grab it and indeed when you can grab it. Uh, so that might be a good way is to make a study space that can move with you. So perhaps if you have um, designated times that you tend to study, uh, you can say set up shop on the kitchen table after meals try and give yourself designated times that you use these spaces. As the more regularly you visit a space to use it for studying, the more you are training your brain to remember that it's time to learn there. Now, one thing I've often heard from people is that when they try and study, especially if you live in a very busy environment, maybe with your roommates, maybe with your family, what happens is people come and disturb you when studying. Uh, one thing I found that helped a little bit is that anyone who joins that space uh, and comes in and studies gets handed a particular learning task to help you with. So, for example, if you have your flashcards need you uh, and someone says, could you just? The answer is absolutely. But first, help me with five minutes revision. I quickly found that uh, I had a lot less disturbances when they uh, regularly found that I was asking them to help me revise. And of course, do tailor your stationery to where you're move, having your movable study space as well. So, for example, if you're always writing notes, maybe you are on your bed, maybe you're on your sofa, grab yourself a folding desk uh, or maybe even just a large book or a clipboard so that you have one particular space that you're always returning to to do your work on. You can also, if you're finding it very hard to study indoors or your space is just not conducive to study, try taking it outdoors. Uh, perhaps you can take a nature walk. Sometimes I will take my notes down to the Bay Area here. If you're lucky enough to be near the seaside, you can go there um, and maybe even commandeer a picnic table to revise. 
if you uh, have local study buddies as well, maybe some of the people in your class uh, are also local to you, ask around and maybe make a study group so that you can take yourself out of your own living space and perhaps go to someone else's study space. And you can always set that up perhaps with a potluck dinner. So you come together, do a study sesh and share some food. Both of those are great ways as well to also get your brain a little bit more relaxed as if you tend to study, eat, live and do everything in the same space, it can become one long blur. And I've often had great experiences revising for an exam by doing it in an unusual place like by the sea uh, because my brain would definitely remember more what happened at that unusual time. Now, if you do have a, a great space that you like, maybe you already have your desk space, maybe you already have your favorite spot on the sofa, create yourself a toolkit to work with. Now, again, this can be your folders, your notebooks, your chargers. Uh, this can actually be a, a toolkit that could be perhaps your school bag that you're not using at the moment to go to and from. It could even be a storage tote that you pick up at the local store, or uh, I have often actually just used a spare cardboard box. And I just use that to put everything I need for studying in it so is that when I'm ready to revise and I feel like I've got a good idea, I don't have to spend 10 minutes finding my flashcards somewhere. And of course, do make your study space filled with your favorite things and take away the things that drink up your time. So for example, train your brain not to have your phone near you when revising, or perhaps even put it on a do not disturb schedule if you have a regular time that you study. And of course, tailor your stationery to you. So for example, I like to really see every day what my tasks are, and that's a tip we'll be going over later in time management. But uh, some people also find that having all the tasks laid out in front of them might actually be overwhelming. So have a think about what makes you most comfortable when you sit down to study. Is it a minimalist space where there's simply one task in front of you? Or is it instead everything around you if you're a clutterbug like me uh, and all of your exciting stationery and favorite pens that can feel a bit more homely when studying? And if uh, you find that you really have a space that just is not conducive to studying, maybe it's very busy, maybe you're sharing it with a lot of people, try and think about the bits that you can control. So for example, using noise cancelling headphones or earplugs can really block out ambient sound and make it a little easier, or indeed play some music that's your favourite and quite relaxing. Lots of options out there for study music that will help overlay a sense of calm and ownership of the space, even if it's a little chaotic. I've even heard some people using particular scents. Uh, so when they were revising for an exam, uh, they would have their favorite uh, cologne or perfume, or maybe even just a particular scent they like, like a cup of coffee near them. And if you always associate that scent with studying, when you sit down to study in that sense there, it will actually activate the neural pathways in your brain and remind you that it's time to study. Very much like we get excited when we know that we're going to our perhaps a uh, favorite movie or something is like that. Your brain can remember it. And even clothing. So if you wake up and you've uh, perhaps are always in your PJs, maybe try throwing on some different clothing to revise. It sounds crazy, but can be a great way to break the monotony of studying and just get your brain trained to think, okay, I'm wearing my business clothes, it's business time. Now, in along with this, organization really is the top key to removing all of those barriers to you studying. So really, we want to make it so is that simply you taking in information, recalling it and building the structures and links in your brain is the only challenge you have to face. So is that you're not, for example, hunting down your notes. Any system for collating all of your papers together is valid. Uh, I personally, as I said, used a cardboard box at one point uh, because it just meant that although I didn't have time to file everything or make it into nice folders, I knew that every single piece of paper related to my studying, even those scrappy notes I made five minutes in the morning while watching a lecture, were collated somewhere and then I could get them when I need them. Or if you are very organized and you really like having everything just so, why not take over a wall in your space and use it as a giant planning board? So you can actually stick folders to the wall using some uh, 
a sticky sticky tack or I'm not sure what they call it here perhaps sticky tape we call it stick some folders to the wall and just make a giant planning space people often ask as well whether it's better to do paper or analog or digital and really the choice between paper analog or digital is entirely your own or maybe even both some people find that it does help them to remember things by writing out, particularly if you're a practical or kinetic learner and tend to remember things by actually doing it. Other people prefer digital because you can use uh, tags and leave searchable tags in there, which is a bit easier for you to find. Either way, pick one particular method and tend to store everything there. So for example, if you find that you tend to use Google Drive as your main source of information, uh, try just snapping a picture of any notes you make on paper using your phone and uploading the images to Google Drive. And also you can leave yourself hints and pointers. So for example, I always remember to put a date on anything I write on so is that if I come to it later, I know when I made those revision notes as often some of the classes can kind of blend into each other. And also if you're doing uh, remote classes, Sometimes the classes themselves just blend together. One way to combat this is to keep a list of key dates, for example, major exams, major revision sessions, maybe study group times, so that you have a constant reminder near you of where those dates are coming up and they don't get to sneak by you accidentally. Now I'm just gonna unshare for a second uh, to just see how we're doing here. Now, normally what we do is we'd have an extended design sprint where we look at all different sources of information and collate it together. But today we're actually gonna do that for you to save you a bit of an effort. I'm gonna go ahead and jump ahead so that we can actually go to all of the information that's normally gathered together in these uh, and go straight into the time management tips. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. There we go. And again, if you're following along on the presentation, you can get these tips and tricks anytime by going to the QR code that's on the screen now, and it will take you to the presentation. Now, time management is one of the harder things to deal with when we're dealing with study skills and academic life and also creating your study space because really often we're living in exactly the same space. Um, and if like me, you kind of get up, do your work, do your washing, cook your meals, everything, even socializing now via Zoom is done in the one space you live in. That means time management becomes absolutely critical to be able to delineate time for you to learn, delineate time for you to live, and also to put your work aside every now and then just to be able to give your brain space to relax and do something that's not university related. Now I've got a couple of methods here that people have really gathered together during previous presentations, design and sprints, when we've had crowdsourced a lot of information and sifted out some really good methods that I'm gonna share with you today. One of them is called the three, two, one method. This is really good if you find that you're completely overwhelmed with work and there just seems like a million things to do and you're not really sure which to prioritize. This is great to pair with other time management planning methods, which we'll go through in a minute. And if you have a big list of things to do, it can be great to pick out just three manageable goals that you're going to go for for the day. And they don't have to be big goals. It could even be as simple as replying to a particularly important email, uh, doing 10 minutes of revision, and then maybe completing a problem set. Reducing the amount of tasks you have to do really helps your brain focus on an subconscious level so is that it's able to know that there's only a few tasks that it needs to prioritize on uh, and this is actually tapping into uh, some very um, deep level thinking in the brain uh, which is related to those almost fight or flight responses which is when we're really pressured when we're really taxed our brains tend to shut out extraneous information and focus down and you can actually leverage this particular trait of brains by setting it some particular goals to focus on which will help you reduce the amount of anxiety you have around other goals and focus in on those. Now because you have these three goals you're also going to need two periods of rest during the day 
and you can figure out when for you is your most optimum time for working. For me, it's the evening for sure. Uh, I'm much better at learning in the evening than I am at 7 a.m. Uh, and if you don't know when exactly your best time is or your most optimum, try noting on your phone when you do feel particularly productive and then over time you will tend to see that pattern emerging. So try and schedule those three tasks that you have to do on your most productive times and then bookend them with rest periods. It's really important to take even just 10 minutes off to let your brain focus on something else. Uh, rather like when you're working out, if you're a fan of CrossFit or going to the gym, uh, muscles need time to recharge after they've done a lot of effort. And the brain very much is one of the strongest muscles we have. So when you're focusing, when you're revising, when you're learning hard, your brain is using a lot of energy. And if you take a rest, give it time to recharge, give it time to re-energize. When you come back to studying, you will continue to be able to maximize your efficiency. And then of course, don't forget the one, the one self-care activity a day that you do, that's something just for you that is totally not productive. Uh, for me, that might be a quick game on Stardew Valley, uh, or it might be indeed trying out a new tea that I've found, or it could be even just painting my nails, something that is totally not productive or university related. And it could even be just five minutes, but making sure every day you make time for that one thing can make a pattern that will really help pay off over long term as you continue to do lots of work. Another good idea is that if you have lots and lots of uh, different projects going, put them into their own individual folders. And again, the dollar store is a great place to grab those folders, or you can even use letter sized paper, just folded in half uh, and then use that as a little containing folder if you don't have folders to hand. Each of those projects then lives in its own space. And when you're going to be working on something, perhaps one of those three manageable goals you set, you check it out from its main space and bring it to your workspace. This is helpful if you tend to get distracted while working and you want to do lots of different things or tend to jump about, as then you only have one particular set of materials in front of you and that's the only work you're actually focusing on. It can also be quite good for the brain as well if you check out the work you're going to do for the day. So perhaps if I'm going to revise dynamics, I'd bring my dynamics notes and then maybe also do some flashcards, I'd bring those. And then as I'm finished with that work, take it away from the desk and literally seeing your work disappear from the desk is quite good for your brain and helps reward you. In the same way, if you like making lists, maintain a list and make sure you check off the work as you get it done. Uh, a good idea as well is to break down tasks into smaller chunks for lists. So for example, if you're really struggling getting going with revision, break that task down. Instead of having one task of revision, break it into gathering revision materials, doing a 20 minute sprint, and then of course a reward for doing that revision. And of course, tick them off as you go and reward yourself for doing it. Now with revision, time management can often be quite a crunch because you're not only trying to do assignments and problem solving and problem sets, you're also trying to cram for exams. And of course, do start early, that's a top tip. It sounds obvious, uh, but it's often very hard a week ahead to see it as quite imminent. Uh, but if you start early, you can create a manageable work plan. And of course, do check the deadlines and the required topics and all the information ahead of time. So you know exactly when you'll be doing your exams or key open papers, for example, and you'll have time to prepare. Now, when I mentioned that three to one method earlier, thinking about just picking three tasks a day that you feel are manageable, getting a list of all of your tasks is a really good way to do what we call sifted waterfall planning. And this is actually a technique used in project management, uh, particularly out in the construction industry. The idea here is you spend just five minutes sitting down and writing down literally all the tasks you can think of. Everything from brushing your teeth to emails that you have to write to revision that you have to do, everything you can possibly think of. And the idea here is it helps reduce anxiety because instead of your brain constantly keeping those pieces of information in short term memory, you have removed them out onto a piece of paper and can not have to keep that in your subconscious. 
You can then break these tasks down, such as the revision I mentioned, going from just revision to gathering materials, a sprint and a reward, and figure out all of the different subtasks that you need to do for that. Then here's the key two pieces. You assign priority. So each morning when you wake up or when you're ready to start your work, whatever time of day that might be best for you, for me it's evening, you go through this list and have a look at what is most priority. Obviously, the closer to the deadline, the higher the priority, and also the harder the task, the higher the priority. And then from this, pick out those top priorities and make them into a daily to-do list. And of course, again, those rewards for when you get it done. Another way to work if you find that you have really a lot of work and a lot of it's pretty important, but some of it is truly important, is to work on the critical path method. This is good to use if week to week your work ebbs and flows and sometimes some of the work is truly critical and extremely time sensitive and then other weeks that changes very much. The idea here is to use that waterfall planning list, the big list of things we have to do, to find the most important tasks that you have to do. Try and estimate how long you think they're going to take and add a little bit of extra buffer time as well. So for example, if I'm revising for an exam, and there's five main topics, that's gonna to be probably around five hours of preparation, which of course I'm not going to try and do in one go. Uh, and maybe make it around six hours to add a bit of padded time. And then I schedule in time to do this. And I try and be really selfish with me at my time at those moments. So for example, if I'm going to be revising from four to five in the evening, I make sure to put my phone on to do not disturb and any other tasks that come in, I ignore. Even uh, emails that come in, I'll put the phone down so that I can't see them come in and just totally focus. This helps me work in sprints. This means that I'm working in a very dedicated manner, very intensively on a particular task for a short time, 20 minutes to an hour. And when it's done, I put it down and I don't come back to it until the next scheduled time. This again helps reduce anxiety in the brain as your brain becomes clear about when you're going to be working on something and when you're not and it helps you if you have to jump from task to task. The reason we call it critical path method is if you prioritize and use it to uh, work on sprints on those most critical activities or revision that you have to do it's a great way to keep track of which things are most important and which tasks can maybe be pushed off to a little bit later. Another question I often get is about group studying and having effective time use there. And these are the top six tips that we've come up with is pulled out of all of the information we've gathered from lots of different workshops and presentations. Uh, one of the best is to use when to meet or doodle or other softwares like this to be able to find the easiest time to meet. So rather than emailing back and forth, uh, use a particular method. You can even just write down which days you're available and times as well uh, to be able to see when your times overlap with other people's times. And make sure you make an agenda for your study group. So if you're going to get together and revise, literally list out which topics you'd like to do and how many questions on each. And usually when you make an agenda, uh, we actually get done around 50% of what we would like to do. Uh, so try and make those agenda a little bit shorter than you would think and make sure you reflect at the end to see if you actually hit those goals or if they need to be added to the next agenda. Another good way is to get everyone together and make a concept map. And this is a map of all the different ideas, questions, or maybe topics. And we'll have an example later in this presentation. And you could mark it for things that you feel particularly comfortable with or that you particularly want help with. If everyone completes one of these in the study group, you can then use it kind of like a Venn diagram to see the subjects that need the least help because everyone feels most confident about them or the subjects that you're probably going to spend most of your time on because most people are having problems with them. Now, as you go through your study groups, do keep a master list of questions. A Google Doc is a great way to keep this digital and not get it lost. Uh, so is that when you do come up with questions you can't answer or things that you need to clarify, you have a ready made list to take to office hours. And of course, do go to office hours because they are a great help. 
another good tip is that if you're finding studying a bit onerous, maybe you're finding it a bit hard to get motivation going, try combining it with something a little bit social to ease it up so everyone gets their favourite lunch or dinner uh, and gathers together to study while munching. And if you have time, uh, it can be great as well to make quizzes. So if you're all working from the same information, maybe the same problem sets uh, that you have for revision, you can try quizzing each other and having prizes, even if they're just silly, like pictures of cute cats, uh, to help motivate you and motivate others, as there's nothing like having someone sending you a cute picture as a reward for getting something right to break up the monotony of studying. Now I know that it is at the moment that a uh, wonderful time of year that is exam time and that means it's revision time as well. So we're going to look at the top tips that have been crowdsourced around revision that you can use to maximise your learning. Now when I was talking about learning earlier and, and how the brain works, there's all different ways that we conceptualize how learning happens in the brain but there's some particular ones that you can see which of these resonate most with you and then use a particular methods that are helpful. So one of them is called cognitivism and this is a particular look on learning where we really regard information as sort of a set of data that we then tag or hashtag and sort into our brains. If you find that you tend to look at information and kind of classify it in your brain, then you may find concept maps particularly helpful. And of course, muddiest point question sheet is a really good method as well. Muddiest point is a name for when you figure out the one point from your studying or your revision session that you are least clear about. And then you add that to a question sheet to be able to take to a GSI so is that when you have office hours or you're working with others you have a ready-made agenda of your least um, or the points you need the most help with. If you find that you tend to be a creature of habit, uh, for example you have good success with creating a study space and getting that repetitious studying going, you may find the behaviorism model quite useful. This is very much the same thing as when you sing your ABCs, you remember the ABCs, or hopefully know them anyway, uh, but it's the tune that's triggering off your memory. You can use mnemonics for all sorts of different things. So this is typically one way we remember the order of the planets with a particular phrase, such as my, my great aunt just sat upon a porcupine, etc. You can make your own mnemonics for your work. So if you have equations, try making up silly phrases to remind you what the different terms mean. And in a similar way, reminder objects can be quite useful. So for example, if you're always using particular sets of equations, try literally thinking of when you are, uh, for example, holding your pen that might have different colors on it, actually thinking about the equation and say, for example, tapping the pen in a particular way when you say the equation. It sounds a bit crazy, uh, but rather like Pavlov's experiment with the ringing bell and the dogs getting excited to eat when they heard the ringing bell, you can literally train your own brain so that then the next time you're looking at your pen, it will actually reactivate the circuits in your brain and be more likely to be able to recall that equation. Also, it could be quite good to stick up notes around your space with lots of information in them. So, for example, a list of equations, uh, write them out on a piece of paper and then stick it up somewhere where you tend to look at rather aimlessly while something else is happening. Uh, for me, this is definitely the door of my microwave. So when I make my tea, uh, I'm waiting it for it to go bing uh, and I'm just staring at the microwave door. I've had good success by popping those equation pages onto the microwave door. So I'm literally just staring at that page and you take in a lot of information passively. If you're someone that likes to build up knowledge step by step, so for example, you feel most comfortable with learning when you learn the equation then learn what it means and then try a simple problem and then a harder problem. Uh, you may find that passively watching or listening to lecture notes, maybe during breakfast or lunch, or maybe while you're hanging out in the bath, wherever, is a good way to take in extra information. And also exchanging knowledge. So for example, in your study groups, uh, asking someone if they feel particularly good about a particular topic to just give a five minute summary that you then listen to is a great way to take in knowledge and append onto to add on to the knowledge you have. 
Now, one thing that is really good idea to check is that when you're revising, make sure that you're actually actively learning. It is so easy to read a page and think, I totally know that. But then when asked off cold in an exam, it's really hard to recall. The idea here uh, is following a particular study of learning, a particular philosophy uh, using Bloom's taxonomy that says if you're just remembering a fact, for example, the equation F equals MA, it's even better to be able to apply that information, for example, be able to use it to calculate force, and then be able to even evaluate the answer you're getting out or rearrange the equation to create something new. Recalling is the lowest level, analyzing is higher, but getting up to that top creation and evaluation is where your brain is most able to recall information. A great way is to check whether you're actually in that active learning of evaluation and creation is to check whether the knowledge is going in. You could, for example, make your own revision manual uh, by drawing out a particular page of notes for each topic you're uh, studying, and it's gonna be an example in a moment. Uh, you can also rehearse the success. So when you find an equation that you do know and you solve a question, take two minutes to reflect just on the process you went through and the, the success you did, which will help your brain remember the correct method. And of course, creating flashcards, either with notes or indeed there's many software out there. And again, do a very short amount of revision, but many times a day. So when you wake up and brush your teeth, two minutes of flashcard revision. Every time you cook uh, your meal or have a cup of tea, two minutes of flashcard revision. This repetitious learning, uh, very much like how we learn to do, uh, for example, our favorite sports by doing it again and again until we become perfect is a great way. And if you are really into streaming or perhaps you have your, you really enjoy YouTubing, why not make your very own revision study channel? Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be posh. It can just be you reading your notes out. But that's actually a really good way to organize information. And it will quickly show whether you know the information offhand off the top of your head, or if you find yourself going back to your notes a lot, that might suggest you need another quick revision sesh. And again, for group study, checking that you're actively learning, for example, pairing up, talking about a question, working on it a bit, and then sharing back out with everyone is a great method, as is the flipped classroom, which is if you're particularly confident about a subject or you have a good handle on one part of it, explaining and teaching others and getting them to teach you back, perhaps in a 20 minute masterclass. And again, that muddiest point, when you're studying, Find the one thing that you understood the least and put it onto a list of questions so that you have a triage list to be able to make sure you are actually capturing the information that you don't know. I also wanted to finish off here by showing a concept map. So these are very powerful visual representations of information. So for example, uh, in the center of the concept map could be the class and then around the particular topics you study and then around those perhaps the equations or piece of information. You can build up a map from the syllabuses, uh, perhaps with interactions with GSIs, asking them for help there. And you can also use it as a great way to track your revision. So if you've built a map of all of the different concepts you're going to be learning, you can use colors to tag which you feel good about and which you want to revise on. And you can also track how often you're doing revisions on those subjects by saying good, okay, or more revision needed. And in a similar way, if you have courses that tend to have a lot of detail on particular topics, try making a single page summary of that particular topic. So this one is an example of respiration. And in this presentation, if you look at the presenter notes panel at the bottom, uh, it has the information of who created this. Uh, and it really uses a balance of drawing, colors and writing to be able to summarize all of that information down. Now, the key thing here is that actually going through the process of making it is the revision itself. And then you can use this as well, perhaps stick it up somewhere in your home that you regularly look at so that every time you're looking at it, it's reiterating that information in your brain. And then lastly, I wanted to share a really good method uh, that 
people use to be able to explain things and discover what knowledge they know and what knowledge they don't know. This is called the rubber ducky debugging method used heavily within the programming and computer science industry. And the idea here is that when you've learned something, take five minutes to just stop or maybe 10 minutes and explain what you know to an inanimate object. It sounds a bit crazy, uh, but it actually forces your brain to move from just recall right up there into the creation higher order thinking uh, and quickly exposes the knowledge that you're not sure about and helps you figure out where to revise. Now in the last few minutes here, we're gonna spend a, a very few moments looking at the ways to maximize your wellness so that when you're doing all of this learning, you're also looking after yourself too. One good way is to be aware of particular mental blocks that can come up with lots and lots of studying. Learning is hard. You are literally remapping your brain. So be kind to yourself during this process. Now, we often see two common uh, mental blocks that people can find, particularly when you're studying hard uh, and everything is quite challenging as it is at the moment in the world. One is called the imposter syndrome, which is when we feel perhaps a bit detached, a bit lost, uh, maybe out of place, or we start comparing ourselves to others and saying, well, you know, what about their GPA? Or it's really easy to feel like you're the out one out of place. But this is a particular mental trap that we fall into. And if you keep mindful of it, it's easier to avoid. In a similar way, the duck syndrome, just as when people say, hi, how are you? Uh, you tend to say, oh, I'm OK, uh, but often we're not actually very OK. Duck syndrome is when we think about the ducks swimming serenely along the water. They look so serene, floating along, but actually under the surface, the feet are going like crazy. Uh, and what happens here is that we often think everyone else is having an easy time of it or looks like they're coping better. But in fact, everyone's running at complete maximums, often including the professors. Uh, so do remember these particular mental blocks that we can fall into to keep yourself mindful to avoid them. And then another tip is when you're starting to feel a bit overwhelmed, when it's getting a bit much, it's a really good idea to check in and look for some resources before you feel like you're reaching your maximum. So just when you start to feel a little bit overwhelmed, a bit overloaded, that's a great time to check in and maybe just spend five minutes of your time looking after yourself a day to look for some resources. Now there's a couple on the screen there, including a QR code that will take you to there anytime. But you can also look up things like the Student Union at UC Berkeley that has loads of different services to help you. Could be around getting some extra support with food security, could be around questions with housing. They also have some great well-being tips. So when you're starting to feel a bit overloaded, that's a great time to reach out to support ahead of when you start to feel really overloaded. And then lastly, uh, if you are finding that you're a bit isolated online, it can be a bit weird because you don't have those normal interactions you normally would, try challenging yourself to reach out and make some new connections. And if you feel a bit overwhelmed by that, a good method is called stakeholder mapping. Uh, it's kind of like a target board where you have different zones. At the very center is the classes that you tend to have a lot of interaction with, for example, the GSI or the course mate you regularly see. Then further out of that, maybe check out your department and see if there's any uh, affinity groups you could join or indeed uh, perhaps student councils you can reach out to or even academic advisors who might have connections to more resources. And then of course there's the Berkeley Bubble Social Clubs the wonderful, wonderful ESS, of course, all of these different places that might have some different options for you. And then, of course, the world outside Berkeley. Have a think about if your friends or family or maybe a teacher who used to be a great support, reach out to them and say, hey, you know, I'm looking at this, I need that, and see what they could do. Even if it's just a five minute encouraging chat per week, often reaching out to people can have some great opportunities. And if you do uh, 
reach out to people, make sure to prioritize and keep regular updates. So for example, the more communication you have with your teaching team, the better. Uh, for example, maybe it's your professional zone, keeping your LinkedIn updated. Perhaps it's keeping in touch with the clubs or perhaps it's just doing those emails or picking up the phone to a friend or family just to keep yourself in contact. And of course, if you find this onerous, there's even softwares out there that can help you do that. So hopefully we went through a deep dive of all of the best tips, tricks, and uh, good ideas that are, oh, excuse me, good ideas that are out there uh, to be able to maximize your studying for creating a study space and the best academic life skills. If you found this useful today, or maybe if you can see something that you'd like to improve or suggest, we'd love to hear from you. And there's a QR code on the screen there that will take you to a two minute exit survey, just with a couple of questions, or indeed the link that's on the screen. Uh, and do be honest as it's anonymous, so we'd love to hear of any improvements we might be able to make. Well, thank you very much for joining me, Dr. Sonia Travaglini, for, for looking at optimizing your study skills, optimizing your learning, and ultimately creating a study space and getting great academic life skills. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and leave some time for questions if there's any extra questions there. Thanks.